All right, we got so much stuff to cover here that we're going to start off with a little comic strip. Can everyone see that? I'll read it for you just in case. Okay, this first one, this is what it says. People decide to hear God speak like this. In other words, lighthearted, happy, cheery. The first one says, oh, also God heard the bake sale last Thursday went really well. He said, great work. Then you jump over, everyone's clapping. It says, Gladys, is there a Gladys here? I'm Gladys. Ah, God speaks through me now and says, you changed your hair. She's like, yeah. God says it looks really sexy. <laughs> yeah. That would be what, we, what we'd like to see, hear from God. But unfortunately, Jeremiah goes the complete opposite route and says there's nothing sexy about what you guys are doing. Nothing. So look, let's get right into it. Jeremiah's ministry was to prepare the people for the coming judgment as a result of their continuous breaking of the covenant with no repentance. At this point, their fate is sealed, it's done. And Jeremiah is called as a very young man to speak the word of God to the people of Judah, which was the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom at this point is already destroyed. It's referred to as Samaria, as the older sister. When you were reading Jeremiah, you may have referred how it says, like, there'll be this, this uh, what's the, not parable, but what's the word they use? There'll be a saying, an expression that says, uh, like older sister goes the younger sister meaning that Judah was the younger sister of Samaria. In the same way that Samaria fell into idolatry, other gods, and then destruction, so Judah is following in the same way. And in Jeremiah 1, 4, 8, and 10, this is where you see God says, Jeremiah, I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. And he's like, whoa, me? How can I do it? I'm just a youth. And God says, don't say, you know, you're just a youth. Rather, I've called you to the nations. You're going to tear down and build up and speak and prophesy and basically says... You're, you're in for a, an amazing, tumultuous, supernatural life because as a teenager, I'm calling you to go prophesy to the elders of your entire nation and rebuke them and tell them to change and that God's speaking to you. I'm going to call you and tell you to go to the existing prophets, those prophets who are 60, 70, 80 years old, who are established in the, the nation as prophets and tell them they are not prophets, they are false prophets, God's not speaking through them. You're going to prophesy their destruction and their death for disobeying you, teenage Jeremiah, and you're going to tell the king and all his people to repent because destruction is coming. And if you remember reading, you see that in Jeremiah's life. At one point, there's this really standout time where God tells Jeremiah to go with a yoke on his neck. Right? And he goes with this wooden yoke and he goes and prophesies and says, just as this yoke, you will be yoked and brought to Babylon. And one of the ancient prophets goes and mocks him, takes the yoke and snaps it and says, I prophesy that God says, as this yoke has been broken, God has broken the yoke off our necks and we'll be free. So Jeremiah takes the high road and walks away and God says, go with a stronger yoke this time. Prophesy the same thing, only this time prophesy that guy's death. And he died. What? Yep, and he did. Just as Jeremiah prophesied, done. False prophets don't last long. <clears throat> so, in 15, 1 through 4, they've rejected the previous prophets and their messages, and King Manasseh has locked in their judgment. I'm going to read this one. So in Jeremiah 15... Verse 1 says, Then the Lord said to me, Even, now listen to this language. This is God saying, Done. Even if Moses and Samuel should stand before me, my compassions would not reach out to these people. Send them from my presence and let them go. If they ask you, Where will we go? You must tell them, This is what the Lord says. Those destined for death, to death. Those destined for the sword, to the sword. Those destined for famine to famine and those destined for captivity to captivity. That's where you'll go. I will ordain four kinds of judgment for them. 
This is the Lord's declaration. The sword to kill, the dogs to drag away, and the birds of the sky and the wild animals of the land to devour and destroy. I will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, son of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. Yikes. This is the son of Hezekiah, a king who brought revival to the land. That tells me that Hezekiah was distracted and did a terrible job of parenting. I mean, how can you go from that to the most wicked king in Judah's history? Not only did he turn the nation away from worshiping God, he brought them to worship false gods, child sacrifice, the worst of the worst. He brought in all the, the witches and the war warlocks and all the, the diviners and everything and said, and then he built an idol in the temple. No, no. So God says, because of Manasseh, because of Manasseh, you're done. There's no repentance. I don't care if Moses and Samuel themselves stood before me. Now Moses was known as the prophet of intercession. He changed God's mind multiple times through intercession. Samuel also pleading with God, saving the nation and appointing the very first kings of Israel. He's saying, I don't care if these two guys stood before me and interceded. I would not, I would not change my mind. You're done. That's how serious this is. And this is the message Jeremiah gets to bring. Yeah. That's why he's excited. We're going we're gonna to go right through 1 through 3 systematically because Jeremiah 1, through 1, 2, and 3 basically sums up his whole message in his book. But in 1, 13 through 16, tells us right off the bat what is about to happen to Judah and why. It says, for all the evil they did when they abandoned me to worship other gods in their own works. We're going to see this right here, so I put in all caps, over and over and over again through Jeremiah. God's issue with them is they abandoned him. That's it. Little sub one here. To worship other gods and their own works. They believed they were able to save themselves. They believed they could make treaties with Assyria and Egypt and other nations to be saved. Instead of looking to God, they believed they could do it. We're going to see it referenced also. Chapter 2 starts off with God remembering the loyalty of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it found themselves guilty, meaning if they tried to come and eat of Israel's stuff, God judged them. Done. Guilty. Disaster came on them. We see bride language, judgment. She is a prostitute, a camel in heat. This is God's analogies here. This is how he's viewing his bride that's gone astray, that's abandoned him. She loves strangers, claims trees and rocks as her gods, and then asks Jehovah to save her when in trouble. He responds by reminding her she would not accept his discipline. My bride has forgotten me. Do you hear that language? I'm going to read it, and I want you to just hear this message. It's perfectly done just the way it is. Chapter 2. It's a shorter chapter. So listen to the language being read, and listen to the heart of Jeremiah as I remind you what you've already read. The word of the Lord came to me. Go and announce directly to Jerusalem that this is what the Lord says. I remember the loyalty of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. This is God just reminiscing. I remember when we were in love, when this was, this was a mutual deal. Israel was holy to the Lord. The first fruits of his harvest, all who ate of it, found themselves guilty, and disaster came on them. This is the Lord's declaration. Hear the word of the Lord, house of Jacob, and all families of the house of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your fathers find in me that they went so far from me? Followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves? They stopped asking, where is the Lord who brought us from the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, through a land of drought and darkness, a land no one traveled through and where no one lived? I brought you to a fertile land to eat its fruit and bounty, but after you entered it, you defiled my land. You made my inheritance detestable. The priests quit asking, where is the Lord? The experts in the law no longer knew me, and the rulers rebelled against me. The prophets 
prophesied by Baal and followed useless idols. Therefore, I will bring a case against you again. This is the Lord's declaration. I will bring a case against your children's children. Cross over to Cyprus and take a look. Send someone to Qatar and consider carefully. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever exchanged its gods? He's dumbfounded. He's like, nations don't do this. Nations have gods and that's it. They don't change them. But they were not even gods. Yet my people have exchanged their glory, meaning him, for useless idols. Be horrified at this, heavens. Be shocked and utterly appalled. This is the Lord's declaration. For my people have committed two evils. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that could not hold water. And this is here we see again, repeating this. Abandoned him and trusted in their own works, these cracked cisterns that couldn't hold water. Is Israel a slave? Was he born into slavery? Why else has he become a prey? The young lions have roared at him. They have roared loudly. They have laid waste in his land. His cities are in ruin without inhabitants. The men of Memphis and Tapanes have also broken your skull. Have you not brought this on yourself by abandoning the Lord your God while he was leading you along the way? That's foreshadowing and alluding to the covenants that they agreed upon. We're going to hit on that in a little bit. Now, what will you gain by traveling along the way to Egypt to drink the waters of the Nile? This is him talking about them looking for help at other nations. What will you gain by traveling along the way to Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? Your own evil will discipline you. Your own apostasies will reprimand you. Think it over and see how evil and bitter it is for you to abandon the Lord your God and to have no fear of me. This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. For long ago I broke your yoke. I tore off your chains. You insisted, I will not serve. On every high hill and under every green tree, you lie down like a prostitute. I planted you a choice vine from the very best seed. How then could you turn into a degenerate foreign vine? Even if you wash with lye and use a great amount of soap, the stain of your sin is still in front of me. This is the Lord, Lord God's declaration. How can you protest? I am not defiled. I have not followed the bales. Look at your behavior in the valley. Acknowledge what you have done. You are a swift young camel, twisting and turning on her way, a wild donkey at home in the wilderness. She sniffs the wind in the heat of her desire. Who can control her passion? He just related Israel to a wild donkey in heat, saying, you can't even control yourself. You're just led by whatever instinctual desire you have. Strong words. Strong words come from emotion. God is expressing his very strong emotions right now. And the thing to remember is that emotions are far from wrong. Right? Anger is not sin. In your anger, don't sin. God can have these strong emotions. He never sins in the midst of them, though. We're, we have a hard time putting those together because it's not often that we have these strong emotions without sinning. They often lead us into sin, which is what he's rebuking them for right now. That their passions have led them rather than them leading their passions. Yes. Well, at that point, they still had Moses leading him, and so as a nation, they feared God and they served him, they obeyed him, and Joshua followed up afterwards. So there was always, there's always that, and they just, the earth would open up and swallow him, snakes would come out and bite him, you know, just God always dealt with them. At this point, the leaders and the rulers have led Israel away, so. It says, All who look for her will not become tired. Did you hear what he just said? Just think about that. All who look for her will not become tired. You don't have to look far or hard to find her. She's willing to give herself away to anyone. Just, you know, her, her phone number's on the back of every bathroom stall. Wherever you go, you can find her. No hard looking. <clears throat> they will find her in her mating season. Keep your feet from going bare and your throat from thirst. But you say, it's hopeless. I love strangers and I will continue to follow them. 
Like the shame of a thief when he is caught, so the house of Israel has been put to shame. They, their kings, their officials, their priests, and their prophets say to a tree, You are my father, and to a stone, you gave birth to me. For they have turned their back to me and not their face. Yet in their time of disaster they beg, Rise up and save us. God's response says, But where are your gods you made for yourself? Let them rise up and save you in your time of disaster if they can. For your gods are as numerous as your cities, Judah. And remember, he's relating these gods to idolatry, to partners, to everything. This picture, the reason why he's being so graphic and why I'm emphasizing his graphicness is because I'm trying to really drill home how God views his people in relationship. That this is serious stuff to him, and it, this is not a brother-sister relationship, this is not buddy-buddy, this is not friend. This is God saying the highest form of human intimacy is how I'm communicating my relationship with you, and this is the equivalent of what you're doing to me in relation to that highest form of intimacy. And it's disastrous, and he's making it clear through the mouth of a teenager. So it says, why do you bring a case against me, is what they'd say. All of you have rebelled against me. This is the Lord's declaration. I have struck down your children in vain. They would not accept discipline. Your own sword has devoured your prophets like a ravaging lion. Evil generation, pay attention to the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land of dense darkness? Why do my people claim we will go where we want? We will no longer come to you. Can a young woman forget her jewelry or a bride her wedding sash? Yet my people have forgotten me for countless days. How skillfully you pursue love. You also teach evil women your ways. Moreover, your skirts are stained with the blood of the innocent poor. You did not catch them breaking and entering, but in spite of all these things, you claim, I am innocent. His anger is sure to turn away from me, but I will certainly judge you because you have said, I have not sinned. How unstable you are, constantly changing your ways. You will be put to shame by Egypt, just as you were put to shame by Assyria. Moreover, you will be let out from here with your hands on your head, since the Lord has rejected those you trust. You will not succeed, even with their help. It's a long, intense chapter. But his message did not break for a second. And God himself felt like that much was necessary. This is why Jeremiah is referred to as the weeping prophet. This is the message. He is preaching a message of done. And wait till you see where we go with this. I mean, it's, it's really, really a heavy message. It's sad, and it's meant to be that way in order to communicate God's heart at this moment in Israel's history, in his people's history, in his pursuit for a bride that has gone so wayward that for, at this point, 600, for about... 1,200, 1,500 years, his pursuit of this bride, his mercy of not destroying her, has finally run out. This is the equivalent of a man forgiving a wife who has willfully and intentionally cheated on him 25 different times. And each time, come back and apologize, and then gone back and done it, and being forgiven and taken back every time. God at this point is saying, sorry, your fate's sealed. So it's pretty intense. Now I highlighted this part in chapter 2 because this just stands out. He is literally dumbfounded. He is like saying, you are doing things no nation in the history of the world has ever done. What nation exchanges their gods? What nation does that? It would be like America just up and changing its, its flag, its national anthem, its government, everything, just and bringing in new ones and changing everything, just to do it. It'd be, it'd be un, unheard of. This is worse. This is back in an age where, where science was scarce and everything was the result of the gods and their fury or their favor. And he's saying, can you change, change your gods? I've brought you out of these lands. I've, done, I've destroyed nations in front of you by supernatural signs and wonders. I've sent angels to wipe out entire world powers at your gates, and you exchange your god? Do you have someone that can do better? 
What, trees and rocks and you're calling them your father and your savior? It's like, but when the rubber meets the road and you really need help, you cry out to me. He's like, you're so unstable. You're unstable in so many ways. And it's crazy. I, I love God's practical language, though. I love it. It makes it so clear. It's so easy to understand when you're reading it in this context. You just get it. There's no mystery here. The prophets are not mysterious. They are, matter of fact, they're one-trick ponies when it comes to their message. When you read a prophet, you know what they're doing. So, chapter 3. <laughs> we know there's 61 chapters in Jeremiah. We're not going to read every one of them. <laughs> but 2 and 3 we are. <laughs> He is. He's a teenager that was called to do the most ridiculous things anyone's ever been asked to do in his realm. That would make us very unstable, right? Chapter 20, we're going to get to it. He melts down. He melts down and curses the day he was born, and he says, God, you betrayed me. You lied to me. You overpowered me. You're basically uh, forcing me to do stuff because you're stronger than me, and I can't resist. Oh, he's still very young. I mean, that's chapter 20, and in his, in his prof prophetic message, he's probably he's no later than 30 at the most. <clears throat> so chapter 3, it's full of marriage, divorce, and prostitution language again. God really wants them to understand how he feels and what they've done to him. In verse 1, right off the bat, you have played the prostitute with many partners. Verse 2, where have you not been immoral? You guys didn't think God spoke like that, right? You thought that was modern language, modern slang? Like, <laughs> how have you not seen that yet? This is him saying, where have you not been immoral? <clears throat> you sat waiting by the highways. Verse 3, this is why the showers haven't come. You have the brazen look of a prostitute and refuse to be ashamed. Verse 20, however, as a woman may betray her lover, so you have betrayed me. I mean, his language is constant. He never switches themes. God, I'm saying, through all four prophets. Why should I forgive you, he says in chapter 5, verse 7. I satisfied their needs, yet they committed adultery. They gashed themselves at the prostitute's house. They are well-fed, eager stallions, each neighing after someone else's wife. He's painting a picture of just reckless debauchery out of control. This gashing at the, the house of the prostitutes, talking about... Uh, idol worship where they would cut themselves to, to worship and honor and make sacrifice to other gods. This was not the prostitute houses we're thinking of. This was complete idolatry worshiping of false gods with sex as, as the primary means and sacrifice to worship another god, a tree, a rock, an idol, a Baal. And the term Baal translated just means master. So in other words, here, this is our master, right? Chapter 22, verse 20 to 22. It says, for all your lovers have been crushed. The wind will take away all your shepherds, and your lovers will go into captivity. Then you will be ashamed. This is a constant theme, but I want to, again, read right through chapter 3. So stick with me and listen again. Just let this sink in, and then we're going to jump through Jeremiah in hyperspeed after this. If a man divorces his wife and she leaves him to marry another... Can he ever return to her? That's what God just asked him. So if a man divorces his wife and she leaves him to marry another, can he ever return to her? Wouldn't such a land become totally defiled? But you, you have played the prostitute with many partners. Can you return to me? This is the Lord's declaration. Look to the barren heights and see. Where have you not been immoral? You sat waiting for them beside the highways like a, a nomad in the desert. You have defiled the land with your prostitution and wickedness. This is why the showers haven't come. Why there has been no spring rain. You had the brazen look of a prostitute and refused to be ashamed. Have you not lately called to me? My father, you were my friend in my youth. Will he bear a grudge forever? This is what they're saying to him. Will he be endlessly infuriated? This is what you have said, but you have done the evil things you are capable of. In the days of King Josiah, the Lord asked me, and before we go in here, Josiah 
was the, the king after Manasseh. And he brought Israel to the greatest heights of revival since they had seen with David. And Josiah is referred to as the son of David directly many times. Not as the son of Manasseh, not as the son of Hezekiah, but as the son of David. Okay? And this is a man who became king at eight years old. Get that? At eight years old. Okay? But even under his rule, which is where they, they destroyed every high place, every altar, every Baal, they slaughtered every prophet of Baal, every diviner, every witch warlock. Not only did he slaughter them, he refused to let the bones of dead idol worshippers and Baal prophets be allowed in land. So he had them dig up the bones of false prophets, grind them, burn them, and scatter their dust over the rivers. He was on a mission to clean out the land and bring everything back to God. And during his reign, the law, meaning the covenant, the Mosaic covenant in the law, was found again in the temple by a prophetess who dug it out and brought to him. And when he read it and said, what? How have we not known about this? This, this what we're reading is telling us that we are doomed. Josiah read this and said, the law said they made a covenant and said, if you do good, you'll bless you. If you do this, you're... He knew they were in trouble. And so he does this, and God is so moved by his heart, by his passion, by his desire to be right with God, that God says, I cannot relent the judgment that I've promised, but I will delay it so that you don't see it in your time, because you've been so faithful. During Josiah's reign, he does this. And Josiah, in his zeal, also to end, because what we read about Egypt coming and destroying them, this is what we see. During Josiah's reign, he got very zealous and saw Egypt coming up to battle to uh, fight and coming through his land. And so Josiah decided to go out and battle against Egypt and the Pharaoh Necho at the time. And he, he was just like, I got the Lord with me. But the prophets were telling him, don't go. This isn't your battle. If you go, you will die. He will kill you. And Josiah was like, no, I have the Lord with me. And he goes out and he died by King Necho. Killed him. And this was the end of Josiah. And after that, it's just <laughs> kings that follow up right into exile. Uh, but Jeremiah, I mean, Josiah was, he was an epic king from the age of eight right up to the 18, and then he dies before he's 30, I believe. But, I mean, dying at 30, you still rule for 22 years. <laughs> it's longer than most of the kings. So he says, In the days of King Josiah, the Lord asked me, Have you seen what unfaithful Israel has done? She has ascended every high hill and gone under every green tree to prostitute herself there. I thought, after she has done all these things, she will return to me, but she didn't return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. I observed that it was because unfaithful Israel had committed adultery that I had sent her away and had given her a certificate of divorce. Nevertheless, her treacherous sister Judah was not afraid, but also went and prostituted herself. Indifferent to her prostitution, she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah didn't return to me with all her heart, only in pretense. This is the Lord's declaration. The Lord announced to me, Unfaithful Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Why would he say that? Any input? Real quick. Why would he say that unfaithful Israel, the northern kingdom, was not as bad as treacherous Judah, the southern kingdom. Judah was the one that was still the line of David. This is the, the remnant, the promised people. I'll tell you why. He, King Josiah, what it does, right? He has this one huge spike, and then they go right back. The minute they lose this single man leader who wants God, Israel or Judah goes right back to what they're doing. And God is saying that Sure, Judah came to me, but only in pretense. Meaning it, was, it wasn't real. God is saying it was worse because they were treacherous. They were deceiving me. They were lying to me, saying, yeah, yeah, no, we're back, but not for real. Whereas Israel in the north just said, no, we are not worshiping you. You're not our God. No. Right? The New Testament echoes this in Revelation where God said, I'd rather have you be hot or cold, but lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. 
And here's Judah, not being honest, but being treacherous. And this is his response. Nothing misses his eye. He catches everything, and he calls them on it, and they're in big trouble because of it. This is the Lord's declaration. The Lord announced to me, Unfaithful Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go proclaim these words to the north and say, Return, unfaithful Israel. This is the Lord's declaration. I will not look on you with anger, for I am unfailing in my love. This is the Lord's declaration. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt. You have rebelled against the Lord your God. You have scattered your favors to strangers under every green tree and have not obeyed my voice. This is the Lord's declaration. Return, your fa you faithless children. This is the Lord's declaration. It's, he likes to say that. He's reaffirming that this is the Lord, which I would probably do too if this was the message I had to do. Right? I just want to keep reminding you this is not my words. Don't shoot the messenger. This is not Jeremiah's declaration. This is the Lord's declaration. I'm doing what I was told. I like you. But he doesn't. <laughs> this is the Lord's declaration. Return, you faithless children, for I am your master, and I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. I will give you shepherds who are loyal to me, and they will shepherd you with knowledge and skill when you multiply and increase in the land in those days. The Lord's declaration, no one will say any longer the ark of the Lord's covenant. It will never come to mind, and no one will remember or miss it. It will never again be made. At that time, Jerusalem will be called Yahweh's throne, and all the nations will be gathered to it, to the name of Yahweh in Jerusalem. They will cease to follow the stubbornness of their evil hearts. In those days, the house of Judah will join with the house of Israel, and they will come together from the land of the north to the land I had given your ancestors to inherit. It's a major future promise. <clears throat> now this last section here in chapter 3 is about repentance. So follow the message. He just blasted them for three chapters. <clears throat> I thought, how I long to make you my sons and give you a desirable land, the most beautiful inheritance of all the nations. I thought, you will call me my father, and never turn away from me. However, as a woman may betray her lover, so you have betrayed me, house of Israel. This is the Lord's declaration. A sound is heard in the barren heights, the children of Israel weeping and begging for mercy, for they have perverted their way. They have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, you faithless children, I will heal your unfaithfulness. Here we are, coming to you, for you are the Lord our God. Surely... Falsehood comes from the hills, commotion from the mountains. But the salvation of Israel is only in the Lord our God. From the time of our youth, the shameful one has consumed what our fathers have worked for. Their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters, let us lie down in our shame. Let our disgrace cover us. We have sinned against the Lord our God, both we and our fathers. From the time of our youth, even to this day, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. <sighs> I'm just reading it. Imagine if you had to be the guy bringing this message. I think he's referring to Judah, current Judah, saying, everything our fathers worked for and brought us here, we've consumed it, the shameful one, the one that the prophecy is referring to. It's tough, and this is where they're at. This is where, where we're looking. Because of the nation's waywardness and gross, consistent betrayal of God, he is bringing the promised judgment on them. Now, I told you guys to read this, right? Did you guys get to read that? The Deuteronomy 28, 49, and 52? Let's look at this. I want you to see how amazing... Scripture is, the prophets are, the covenant, the Mosaic covenant, how specific it was. In Deuteronomy 28, starting in verse 49, it says, The Lord will bring a nation from far away, from the ends of the earth, to swoop down on you like an eagle, a nation whose language you don't understand, a ruthless nation, showing no respect for the old and not sparing the young. They will eat the offspring of your livestock and your land's produce until you are destroyed. They will leave you no grain, new, new, new wine, oil, young of your herds, or newborn of your flocks until they cause you to perish. They will besiege you within all your gates until your high and fortified walls that you trust in come down throughout your land. They will besiege you within all your gates throughout the land the Lord your God has given you. 
You will eat your children, the flesh of your sons and daughters, the Lord your God has given you during the siege and hardship your enemy imposes on you. That's from Deuteronomy, not Jeremiah. That was written while they were in the wilderness. This was the moment of covenant. This was before they had done anything except say, we will follow you, we're yours. Those are the words of the covenant where God said, if you do good, I'll bless you, and he lists blessings. He said, if you do wrong, I will curse you, and here's what the judgments will look like. That's what we just read. Straight from Deuteronomy, from Moses' mouth, from God's mouth, right to the people, and they all signed on the dotted line and said, we agree. And that, right there, you're looking, that's like 1600 B.C., somewhere around there. And now the time period we're in is right around 590, 600, 590 B.C. So you're talking a thousand years later. A thousand years later, and let's read Jeremiah 5, 15, 19. He says, I am about to bring a nation from far away against you, house of Israel. This is the Lord's declaration. It is an established nation, an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know and whose speech you do not understand. Their quiver is like an open grave. They are all mighty warriors. They will consume your harvest and your food. They will consume your sons and your daughters. They will consume your flocks and your herds. They will consume your vines and your fig trees. They will destroy with the sword your fortified cities in which you trust. But even in those days, this is the Lord's declaration, I will not finish you off. When people ask, for what offense has the Lord our God done all these things to us? You will respond to them, just as you abandoned me and served foreign gods in your land, so will you serve strangers in a land that is not yours. Jeremiah didn't have the law next to him. He didn't have the Old Testament. He didn't have the Torah. Matter of fact, it didn't even get found in the temple until the days of Josiah. So Jeremiah was not reading this and copying it. This was a thousand years later, Jeremiah saying, here's what the Lord is saying, and almost word for word fulfills his covenant promises. What you need to know, too, is when you read, when they sieged the cities, both Assyria and Babylon, north and the south, it got so bad that they did start eating their children right within the walls of Jerusalem. Parents were coming together with their children and making a deal, today we'll eat my kid, tomorrow we'll eat yours. <clears throat> this is what happened. This is God fulfilling his promises. Not all the promises are warm fuzzies, but he is faithful to fulfill his promises. To me, that's impressive. I love seeing that covenant language coming back. I don't love seeing the result of it, but I'm saying I love seeing God do what he said he'd do after a thousand years of mercy. He could have done that on day one of the broken covenant. Instead, he waited an extra 999 years. That's mercy. This is a God of grace. Matter of fact, considering the fact that the whole, old, the whole New Testament consists of, at the furthest, 90 years of history, this is way more grace shown in the Old Testament than was ever shown in the New Testament. Way more. Here's the heart of the issue. Broken covenant. The rejection of their God. We've heard that four or five times already. The betrayal of his bride and the staining of his name. The staining of his name. I'm going to go to Jeremiah again because that's the book we're in. 17.13. Lord, the hope of Israel, all who abandon you will be put to shame. All who turn away from me will be written in the dirt. Why? For they have abandoned the Lord, the fountain of living water. This is just Jeremiah going through, again, reminding them here that they have abandoned him, the fountain of the Lord, and anyone who does that will be put to shame. And this is a verse that uh, I preached on a few months ago. Remember talking about the New Testament where Jesus and in Matthew, no, uh, I think Luke 8 or John 8, one of those. And he goes into the temple, and the woman caught in adultery comes out. And the, they throw him down to trap him, and he gets down and starts writing in the dirt. This is referenced here. 
when you put that story together, it's a long story. We, it's online if you want to hear the message because we don't have time to get into it. But basically, it's talking about the whole feast that they were in was all celebrating God as the source, the fountain of the, the, the early and the latter rain. And that during this festival, they'd always go to God and pray for the rain for the harvest so they could have food for the next season. And Jesus stood up on the eighth and final day, the biggest day there, and literally told them, I am the fountain of living water. All those who are thirsty, come to me and drink, and you will never be thirsty again. Instead, a source of living water will rise up in you. So Jesus stood up and basically said, I'm the answer to all your prayers. Jesus claimed to be God. And he quotes and references this prophetic passage from Jeremiah. Right here. 17, right? This is where we see it. But what the cool thing is, everyone's always wonder, what's he writing in the dirt? And this here gives us at least the brightest light possible on what he was doing writing in the dirt, right? All those who abandon you will be put to shame. Their names will be written in the dirt. They had just rejected Jesus and abandoned the fountain of living water, and here he is writing their names in the dirt as they try to trap him. It's profound. Really cool stuff. In Jeremiah 11, verse 8, these are important sections, that's why I want to read them all. It shows how the real problem is that they have broken the covenant and turned from obeying him. It says, yet they would not obey or pay attention. Each one followed the stubbornness of his evil heart. So I brought on them all the curses of this covenant. Jeremiah just confirming, reaffirming. I brought on them all the curses of this covenant because they had not done what I commanded them to do. If you go back just four verses to verse 4, see where it says big picture right there? This is what it says in verse 4. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Obey the words of the covenant which I commanded your ancestors when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the iron furnace. I declared, obey me and do everything that I command you, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. In order to establish the oath, I swore to your ancestors to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. So there we see that again, right? Again, the desire for you to be my people and I to be your God and me to dwell with you in this promised land. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Now the leaders, the law is in the temple. It's just dust on its shelves. It's not referred to. It would be the equivalent of you having your Bible but never reading it, right? And then your parents never teaching it to your kids, and then your kids don't know anything about it, and when it comes time for them to know it, they're, they're living so recklessly that... But the word covenant, they have a reference to Oh, they're all very... Every one of them knows all the history and the stories and, the, and their God. Plus, don't forget... From the beginning to the end, there's always prophets in the land calling them back continuously. The problem is they reject them, they beat them up, they kill them, they, they, they do everything they have to to not listen. So it's not like God is punishing them for ignorance. He's punishing them for willful ignorance. <clears throat> so, chapter 7 here in chapter 7, it refers to, this, to the places of worship. Shiloh in the north, Jerusalem in the south. And he says, called by my name and where my name dwells that have been defiled in the judgment that is coming because of this. These places were known to the nations. They represented God to the nations. His name, his reputation was being stained before the very nations he wanted to see saved through Israel's example, through its light. So he's, in this chapter, you see God referencing over and over my name, where my name was called, for my name's sake, this place that represented my name. And throughout Jeremiah, he references this over and over. Because a big part of the judgment, and reason for the judgment, was that Israel was called to be a light, right? The example and its light to the nations. They weren't called because God liked them more. They were called for a purpose to be a light, and they've done the complete opposite, and so judgment is coming. God can't take it anymore. His name being stained is just not allowed to, to stand any longer. The nations have, have mocked him, turned into him, overcome them, and he's saying, this is it. I can't allow this. My name has to be redeemed. And this is what you see here in chapter 7. 
in verse 23 even, again, right in the midst of this continual thing, he reminds them, he reminds them and says, However, I did give them this command, Obey me, and then I will be your God, and you will be my people. You must follow every way I command you so that it may go well with you. Yet they didn't listen. It's almost infuriating to continually hear God putting out his desire to be their God and them to be his people in this bride language and constant rejection. It's like, can we get out of the prophets like ASAP? Right? Isn't there a New Testament somewhere? <clears throat> Here's the truth of it. God doesn't want to destroy them. He's made that perfectly clear for a thousand years. He has made it clear. I mean, this is not new news. From the minute he took them out of Egypt, he is continually sparing their rejection of him and they're wanting to abandon him right from the golden calf at the very foot of Mount Sinai. I mean, this is not new. It's a thousand years of, of continually forgiving and bringing back through the wilderness. Forty years. It should have took them forty days because of their rebellion and stubbornness. Then they get into the land and we have the book of Judges which is them constantly looking to themselves and forgetting their God, getting captive, repenting, God saving them, and this cycle over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, yet God never abandons them. Instead, in the days of Samuel, one of the first major prophets we see come on the scene, it says that in his days the word of the Lord was scarce in the land, meaning God had distanced himself from his people so much that the, the tabernacle itself was being used by priests to commit fornication and rape. And there was no judgment. You guys remember the days of the high priest going in with the bells on and the rope? Because if he had an extra dirt, he'd be stricken dead. Now, in the days right before Samuel comes on the scene, Eli's sons are literally forcing, manipulating women into having given sexual favors in exchange for, for prayers. And they're not killed. They're not stricken dead. Man, in the days of Moses, they, they would have been dead three seconds later. Matter of fact, in the days of Moses, there were men who would run into the tent and spear both of them right to the ground and be called righteous for it. No one doing that in the days of Samuel, but here comes Samuel. Right? Comes in the sand, and all of a sudden the voice of God is known in the land again because Samuel comes. And he begins to call them back to repentance and he leads them back into this place of establishment. And then he appoints kings from God's own mouth. Here's Saul, here's David, and now you have the age of kings where Israel becomes a world power. Under David, not a single enemy could stand against him. The entire world trembled at the name of David. Why? Because the reputation of God was glorified under David. Under David, God's name was made famous. Every army that was conquered knew they were conquered by Jehovah. And then Solomon comes along, and through his wisdom, he takes David's military uh, conquests and expands them through political and economical conquest. Now, under Solomon, the nation of Israel is the jewel of the world. Rulers of other nations are coming just to look at Israel, just to look at the temple and at uh, Solomon's uh, castle and, and, and looking at the land and the wealth and it was just overflowing. It was the richest nation ever. Ever. There's never been a man as rich, in, in relative speaking, as Solomon. The wealthiest man on the earth. The wisest man on the earth. This is Solomon. And then he crashes and burns. How? False gods. He disobeyed God's command, married foreign women who brought in their gods, So because of that, judgment comes on the land, the kingdoms get split, north and the south, the rebels go north, David's line goes south, the north gets destroyed in 722, south gets destroyed in 586, here we are. The whole time, God's longing for repentance through that whole process, for the entire period. Couple bright spots, you see David, or Samuel, bright spot, David, bright spot, uh, Solomon, believe it or not, I still view as a bright spot. For most of his young life, he was incredible. And then at the end of his life, we have the book of Ecclesiastes, which was him repenting and coming back and saying, listen, all of life comes down to this, fear God and obey his commands. Rough road, but he got there. Come through, you see 
uh, Uzziah, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Josiah. That's about it. Bright spots, though. All the line of David. <clears throat> Here we are. God longs for repentance. God still pleads with them to turn and repent. He says, return, unfaithful Israel. I will not look on you with anger, for I am unfailing in my love. Only repent. <coughs> That's in 3.12 and 3.22. He says, return, you faithless children. I will heal your unfaithfulness. Really? He's going to heal their unfaithfulness. All they have to do is return to their national deity. It's not even an odd concept. 13.17 says, but if you do not listen, I will weep in secret because of your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly, overflowing with tears because the Lord's flock will be taken captive. Is this God communicating his heart? This is no longer mean and tough, gruff God. I'm going to send nations, they're going to kill you and burn your children's children's bones and cast them before your idols. This is God saying, here's, secretly, I am weeping profusely. I am broken hearted over this. In 9, I mean, in 14, 17, he said, Let my eyes overflow with tears. Day and night, may they not stop, for the virgin daughter of my people has been destroyed by a great disaster. An extremely severe wound. That language gets me. His, his, he's describing her as his virgin daughter. This is the, the communication that's been destroyed by a severe wound and him having to sit there and watch helpless because they've not allowed him to help. His heart. Right? In 1615, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of the land of the north, and out of all the countries where he had banished them, for I will restore them to the land I gave their forefathers. I actually want to read that full one in context so you see what God's saying. There's so much hope in that verse. But I don't want you to miss it. Start in verse 14. Remember, God's speaking through Jeremiah to them about their whole history. So here he says, However, take note... The days are coming, the Lord's declaration, when it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites from the land of Egypt. That's what they've always said at this point. But rather, as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites from the land of the north and from all the other lands where he had banished them, for I will return them to their land that I gave to their ancestors. You see what he's saying there? He's saying in the same way that I delivered you from Egypt when you were in captivity... I'm going to deliver you from Babylon when you're in captivity. And the new saying will overshadow the old. No longer will they say, just how, remember how he delivered us from Egypt. The new one will be, remember how he delivered us from Babylon. This is what God's giving them hope right here so early on. This is chapter 16. <clears throat> Yet he's telling them right off the bat, I'm going to replace that saying because I'm going to deliver you again. And I'm going to bring you back here. And this gives them hope because the promises come and it's not talking about what we see in Malachi at the end of the story. It's not talking about what we see when Nehemiah comes and rebuilds the wall and Ezra is reading the law. That is not the fulfillment of these promises. <clears throat> then 22, 29, O land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Lots of repentance, God's heart. There's no mistaking it. We can't really think that this is a, a morbid thing because God is constantly making it clear, his heart. But here, since next week we start the New Testament, here's the transition. <clears throat> New Testament language in Jeremiah, all over the place. In 4.4 he says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, remove the foreskins of your hearts. That's, that's, that's unheard of language to them. Do you understand that? This is Jeremiah telling them, as they're going into captivity, forget this whole circumcision of the flesh thing. Circumcise your hearts. <clears throat> this is where Paul gets the language from. When he's speaking in the New Testament, when he's telling them it doesn't matter about the circumcision of the flesh, it's about circumcising your heart. Jeremiah is the one he's quoting. This is Jeremiah's reference. God in the Old Testament telling them, circumcise your heart. In 31... Verse 31 to 34, it says, Look, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke, even though I had married them. What? You hear that language? Again? <clears throat> what covenants are you referring to there? Abrahamic and Mosaic. Right. Technically, he's referring to both. But the one they broke is the Mosaic one. The one, the new covenant, which is really the fulfillment of the Abrahamic and the extension of it, brought and built by Jesus, is right here in this language. And he's telling them it's going to be a different covenant because it is going to be a different one, right? <clears throat> Not like the one that, that your ancestors and you broke, even though I would married them. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sin. That's in Jeremiah. I'm not reading the Gospels right now. I'm not even reading Paul preaching to a Gentile church. This is the prophet Jeremiah prophesying inescapable judgment to treacherous Judah. And he just said that. Once again, repeating. It's nonstop throughout the whole Bible. You can't escape it. I just, I'm just going to point it out every time we see it. You're going you're gonna to see it in your sleep and when you wake up, this phrase, I will be your God and you will be my people. You won't be able to read your Bible without that flashing in front of you, which is the point. But look, I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. Again, Paul, you didn't know he was such a plagiarist, did you? You thought this was all his original stuff. No, he's quoting Jeremiah over and over and over again. And he'll forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sin. Never again. Guys, this is a promised covenant with Israel and Judah. Just on a totally separate note with the whole Jewish-Palestinian current context and stuff and replacement theology ideas and stuff, which is a crazy theology that thinks that the church replaced Israel and that Israel is just some normal, just irrelevant from this point forward. <clears throat> How can you read the prophets in the Old Testament and really think that a God who makes these promises and says they're eternal promises, and again, right here, he's making this promise and covenant to Jewish people in captivity. <clears throat> There's no reference of the church. The beauty and the mystery of the church, which we're going to get to next week and the week after, is that the promises are expanded. The Jewish Messiah says, I will also be everyone else's Messiah. He doesn't say, I am no longer the Jewish Messiah, I'm just now everybody's Messiah, and the Jews, you can get saved if you want. Paul makes that clear in Romans 10 and 11, read that. But the land is promised to them eternally, forever. All the promises, forever. Jesus, the son of David, will rule from the throne of David. However that happens, I don't know, I couldn't tell you, but I can tell you, this God who operates on 400-year periods of promises and fulfillments, 1,500 years of mercy and grace, I'm probably not going to see it, <clears throat> at least from this perspective. But it's clear. This is God's promised chosen people, not special people, meaning more special than anyone else, not exclusively chosen, which is where I think we get hung up when we think chosen equals exclusive. <clears throat> It's just chosen for the purpose. That's it. They were called to be a light to the nations. They were God's chosen tool to reach the world that he loves so much. <clears throat> they failed miserably. But that's what they've been doing throughout the whole time. That's the, what makes God's promises so epic is that he's unfailing. He's eternal. If he can break his promises to Israel, why should we trust his promises to us? Isn't that what Paul says in Romans 10 and 11? He says, hey, listen, you wild grafted in branch. Don't be so cocky. If God was able to graft in you, you wild and crazy branch, how much easier is it for him to regraft in the original branches? That's what he says. <clears throat> and then he says, here's the deal. This time of Gentiles is coming to an end, and when it's fulfilled, God will return to Israel, and all Israel will be saved. Now, you can interpret that however you want, but the only way it doesn't allow you to interpret it is that that's spiritual Israel, because it's not. 
It's the covenant Israel. Anyway, um, in the end, Jerusalem is destroyed and the southern kingdom of Judah is led into captivity by the Babylonians as promised. Jeremiah continues to prophesy to the people that they need to seek the peace of the city for God has plans to prosper them and give them a future. <clears throat> I'm going to follow those instructions and read it. Jeremiah 29. I referenced this last week, I think during the uh, exhortation period, right? It wasn't during the class. <clears throat> Jeremiah 29, verse 4. Some of you guys will never quote this verse the same again. You shouldn't. <laughs> you, you, once you hear the context, you may not want to claim this promise. <clears throat> this is what the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. So that's who he's talking to. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Seek the shalom of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. For when it prospers, you'll prosper. For this is what the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, says. Don't let your prophets who are among you and your diviners deceive you. And don't listen to the dreams you elicit from them. For they are prophesying falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. This is the Lord's declaration, for this is what the Lord says. When 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your welfare, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. You will call to me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, this is the Lord's declaration, and I will gather and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you. I will restore you to the place I deported you from. This is a big deal for them, but he literally told them to pray for the shalom, which means the fullness, the health, the prosperity, the wealth, the benefit of the city that they've just been enslaved in of the city that just ransacked their homeland, destroyed their city, raped, burned, murdered their daughters, their sons, their wives, their husbands, their brothers, their sisters, right in front of their eyes, slaughtered them. The prophecies say there was blood up to their ankles in the city streets, blood ran, all the crazy stuff that would leave you traumatized for life if you witnessed this. And then they brought into captivity. You know how they brought into captivity? They're stripped naked. They're tied up and chained, and they're dragged in an endless chain of people like this, naked, from there to there, being whipped, being dragged, not being given water. They don't care if you drop dead. You are in the worst of the worst conditions. Then you're brought into this place and thrown into slums, just prison slum areas, where they say, this is where you'll live. Feed yourself. Take care of yourself. It's called de deportation. And also, uh, these nations use things called cross... Uh, Cross, what's the word? I don't know, cross planting of people is what we'll call it. There's a word. Um, but they would do that so that there'd be no um, nas nationality, national pride to create a rebellion. They would mix people groups together. Okay? And you're going to see the results of that in the New Testament with the Samarians, right? Okay? The good Samaritan story was about a half breed meaning this person that w had returned to Israel as a result of being gone for all that time and mixing with other nations and come back, and they were left up north, which was closer to where Babylon was, where they would come back, and they were considered the not pure bloods. And so the pure bloods would treat them like dogs and not associate with them, which is why his parable was so powerful, that pure-blooded Jews would walk by this man in the streets who needed it, but yet the dirty, doggy, mixed breed stopped and took care of him. Jesus' point was the saying, you hypocrites. But that's, that's the natural result. This is the history behind it, that the Samaritan was the result of this cross-pollination that they were doing and was probably a, a descendant from one of the families that was there being asked to pray for the peace of the city. And so God is saying, pray for this peace, and then tells them, listen, you can do it because I have plans for you. I'm not leaving you here. Seventy years, and I'll restore you, and I'll bring you back. 
That's what that promise is for. So if you find yourself in similar situations, claim that promise all you want. But not until you find yourself in a similar situation. This is not the promise to give you a new Mercedes and a six-bedroom house and a lake house. Okay, that God's plans for you probably have nothing to do with that. His plans for them was to save them and bring them back and let them know they've not been totally abandoned. He's saying stay alive. He's saying don't decrease, increase. Yeah. Correct. So yes. <clears throat> yeah, it happened. Be yeah, I, I believe so from the scripture. I mean, you can't argue that when Ruth is in the direct descent, to the direct line of Jesus, right? So if they're willing to serve God, then they become Jews. We see that throughout in, even in the Mosaic Covenant, that any alien who wants to come and is willing to serve God, you're to embrace them wholeheartedly, and, and they become one of you. So, all right, let's move on quick. A couple more slides, and then we're done. Chapter 31, 3 through 6, he says, I have loved you. And this word love is the Hebrew word ahava, and it means intense desire. It's, it's the romantic, strong, passionate love. It's a consuming love. This is the word used in Song of Solomon, where it says that um, love is uh, as strong as death. It's as unyielding as the grave. What he's saying is, Ahava is as strong as death. It's as unyielding as the grave. Many waters cannot quench Ahava. Many rivers can't overflow it. Okay? This is Ahava. That powerful. In the Song of Solomon, the Shulamite woman warned her single friends over and over again, four different times in eight chapters, and said, do not stir up nor awaken Ahava until it pleases. Because she was in the throes of it. She was experiencing the, the overwhelming possession of Ahava that would cause you to be sleepless nights and, and daydreaming days of your, the, the object of this Ahava. And this is the word God chooses to use. And he says, I have ahavad you with an everlasting ahava. Therefore, I have continued to extend faithful love. And he changes the word here to the word chesed, which just means kindness. It changes everything when you understand this. He's saying, I have passionately loved you with an everlasting, never-ending, passionate, desirous love. Therefore, I have continued to extend faithful kindness to you. Again, I will build you so that you will be rebuilt, virgin Israel. You will take up your tambourines again and go out in joyful dancing. You will plant vineyards again on the mountains of Samaria. The planters will plant and will enjoy the fruit. For there will be a day when watchmen will call out in the hill country of Ephraim, Get up, let's go up to Zion, to Yahweh our God. Did you guys notice? Called a virgin Israel. That is huge right there. You could just read past it easily. But this is the same Israel that he's been referring to as a prostitute, as a, a donkey in heat, over and over and over again. And here he's prophesying virgin Israel. Redeemed, restored, completely. Sins to be forgotten and never again remembered. That is awesome. And here, this is where we come down to the man is the message. In 16, 1 through 4, Jeremiah is restricted from being married and having children because this is God's message. He's done. He is done with them. This is a period where he is separating. You are no longer my bride. I will restore you and redeem you, but right now, you're done. I'm putting you away. No, no wife, no children. That's the message, Jeremiah. Your life has to live it. It's exciting. Uh, <clears throat> chapter 20 is where Jeremiah melts down. This is where he says, you know what? Uh, I quit, God. I quit. And every time I try to not have to go speak because every word I speak causes me to be persecuted, abused, ridiculed, made fun of. I'm the laughing stock of Israel because of you. And I try to quit and you overpower me and you manipulate me and you tricked me and you deceived me to speak your words. And even when I stop, I can't because it burns in me like fire shut up in my bones. I can't contain it. So I have to preach and I have to do it. And then he switches after all that, to saying, God, you're awesome. Yay, awesome God overcomes his enemies. And he switches right back and says, curse the day I was born, my mother's womb, that it would be a tomb forever and that nothing would ever come out of me, that I stayed in there. I can't believe I was born. Terrible. That's, that's a Steve paraphrase, but that's the point. 
Jeremiah follows up the destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity of Judah by writing the book of Lamentations, which is just Jeremiah lamenting the plight of Judah and Israel, wishing that they would have just repented and obeyed the Lord. But since they didn't, his home is now gone and he must live in a foreign land. In the end, God will bring out a remnant and bring them back to Jerusalem because of the promise of the covenant made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Here. Here's the review. Let's do a two-minute quick review of all the prophets because we're done with them. <clears throat> but are we really ever done with the prophets? As we read in 2 Peter 3, his whole mission was to, to preach to them so that they would remember all the things that had been prophesied through the prophets. <clears throat> when we get to the New Testament, we're just going to see the prophets fulfilled. But reminder, as we head into the New Testament, God's vision to have a counterpart and bride. We see that most clearly in Ephesians 5.32 where he says this whole husband-wife thing is not even about man and woman. It's about Christ and his church. <clears throat> okay? That he can dwell with as their God and them as his people. And that's just one of about 60 references to that whole I will be your God and you will be my people. But Revelation 21.3 is the final one. This is the proclamation of victory. The purpose of the prophets to call his people to repentance and a restoration of the covenantal relationship with him. Have we seen that clearly? <clears throat> right. Those are all some supporting chapters and verses. We've read them all. But there they are. Okay, you see it in 2 Chronicles 24, 19. This is where God said, I gave you prophets to call you back to me. But you wouldn't listen. And it tells you right there, here's the purpose of prophets, to call you back to me. And so you read there. Their message, <clears throat> always a warning to a degenerate, unfaithful people, that they had broken the covenant by abandoning their God for other lovers and deserved the severe judgment they agreed to. But if they would repent and return to their Lord, he would forgive even their most wicked sins, such as national prostitution, child sacrifice, cannibalism, abandoning God, and trusting themselves. And, they would receive, and he would receive them back as his treasured bride. You get that? Any questions on that? Every one of these, these ones we've read through, you can look back in your notes or on the videos online and refresh yourself if you want. <clears throat> no questions? Everyone's clear on the vision, purpose, and message of the prophets and everything that the Old Testament has lived up to and brought us through. So at this point, I've brought you through all the prophets and explained to you about the exile and where they left off. Basically, when we get to Nehemiah, the temple's rebuilt, but the glory doesn't return. And that's where the story ends. You see that in Malachi? Here's the temple, promises that the glory will return to the temple, and it doesn't. And that's the cliffhanger of the Old Testament. Uh, the temple was built, but the glory didn't come. Now what? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> when I put this online here, Further scriptural support for everything you just learned. <clears throat> okay? These are all verses we didn't get to. Okay? But references to God being our God and us being his people, or to us being chosen as a people of the Lord, look at it. These are all, I mean, nonstop. Ezekiel goes crazy with it. New Testament, right through. Look at the progression Romans, 2 Corinthians, Hebrews, Peter, Revelation. You keep going. You'll get these. When you, when you get it, you'll have this as the resource. Come on, don't fail me on the last slide. Oh, good. Here's further scriptural support for everything you just learned. <laughs> References to God having an exclusive, unique relationship with his people. Marriage or the lack of faithfulness by his people to keep their relationships with the Lord exclusive. I had to shrink the font just to fit it all. <clears throat> okay? Uh, you see there I put Song of Solomon 1.1 1, 1 through 8.14, which is the whole book. Okay? Because it shows the unique exclusive relationship between a man and a woman that gives the insight for, to see what the groom, Christ, and bride should feel for each other in the context of a romantic marriage relation. Right? So this is the commercial right in the middle of the Bible. It doesn't progress the story in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't fit. It, it has no flow. It's just a short commercial love story, Cinderella story, 
so that God can say, this is what I want. New Testament, you're going to see a lot of Jesus' language, like in his parables and and his stories that have so much to do with husbands, wife, grooms, bridegroom, marriage, uh, cheating, you know, all that stuff. So get ready. All right, and your syllabus, I think, says for next week, Matthew, uh, Luke, and John. But it's even less than that. I want you to make sure you read Matthew and make sure you read John and peruse Luke. Definitely read the first three chapters of Luke thorough, and then the rest, peruse. Matthew and Luke are very, very similar in its content. Okay, it's, They're called the synoptic gospels for a reason. Okay, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because the content is almost the same. But Matthew was writing to the Jews specifically, so you get a lot of the prophets. You're going to get a lot of Isaiah right in the first few chapters of Matthew, right off the bat. You'll be very familiar with it, and hopefully things will start clicking in ways they didn't click before, because you'll get it. <clears throat> same with Luke. First three or four chapters of Luke, right there, there's the John the Baptist reference, Gabriel, angel, and stuff, and prophecies, and the Emmanuel stuff, uh, Matthew and, and Luke. And then John, John to me is, is the gospel that brings all the, the heart of God right into the New Testament. It's where you see God made flesh. It's in the gospel of John. And you see the way he interacts and the, the language that John uses. So be prepared for next week, which is the Gospels. Uh, and that'll be Matthew, Luke, and John. Okay? Great. Thank you, Jesus, for an awesome time.